Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Lift up your banner, let the anthem swing. Praise is to our King. The great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. The great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Lift up your banner, let the anthem swing. Praise is to our King. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Amen. Glad to have everyone back this evening. Uh, Brother Stephen, you mind us up in a word of prayer? Sing raise the hallelujah. Sing a little louder, louder than the unbelief. 
go ahead and stand. We got one more song. This is Revelation song. Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this time you've given us to come into your house of worship this, this evening. And God, we just thank you for the beautiful weather and the, and the day that you've given us to just uh, lift up our voices and uh, hear the message that we've given today, Lord, and just most importantly, give honor and glory to you, Lord. That's what we're here for. We just thank you for this world that we have. We thank you for this country. We thank you for the freedom that we're able to still meet in this house freely, Lord, and to lift up your name. I pray, Lord, there's someone here that doesn't know you, that they'd uh, be pricked by the message this morning, I mean, this evening. 
um, and this morning, if they made both services and through the song service and through these words that Brother Pete has, I just pray that you let him uh, deliver what you have to say uh, through him and let it be effective and affect us all tonight. And so in Jesus Christ, I pray, amen. Amen. I want to read scripture with you right quick, okay? One scripture, Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse number 19. And a lot of what I'm going to read out of tonight is actually, I'm going to read a lot from the NLT because... There's, it's a little Solomon, Solomon-like in this part of Jeremiah. And so, um, and I'm going to probably go back and forth a little bit so you can see the clarity of it. But I'm going to read from the verse 19 specifically because I want you to see how pathetic it is at this point in time. Poor Jeremiah having to give the word of God, the voice of God to a people that were very uninterested in what God was trying to say. Verse 19 reads this, my wound is severe, my grief is great. My sickness is incurable, but I must bear it. Now you may be seated, please. When you think about that mindset, how discouraging, how hopeless, how, how I mean, when you consider everything that's going on around them, there's defeat, there, there seems like there's uh, grasping of straws, if you will, because of what has been transpired. And what, did the, what do we see is the aftermath of a lot of poor decisions that leads to where they are. Tonight's message, I gave Chad a mouthful this week, so I, I hope you can see and grasp this, okay? The consequences in determining God to be inconsequential. The consequences. I don't like that word, do you? I remember a lot of times when I would hear the word consequences, it was usually after I had done something I shouldn't have done that I'd been warned, whether it was a teacher, um, a parent, or even an administrator in school. I remember it specifically in different occasions, more than you have time to hear about, because um, it was multiple situations where the word consequence, now you will have to face your consequences, might be something I would have heard for doing something that was really unimportant, but yet I can do this, I can get away with it. Well, whether you're a grade school version of me or you're also a person just trying to navigate life, this is the aftermath, this is the reality, sadly. For many a people today, as it was in Jeremiah's day, the consequences in determining God to be inconsequential. What we tell God matters and how we respond to God matters. Do you understand what I'm saying when I say that? I hope you do. Because everything we do, you understand to sit tonight, you will make decisions one way or the other based on the song service and the preached word of God. You've made decisions partially already. Hopefully, as I love what Austin said in his prayer, yeah, Sunday morning still matters. Maybe it's lingering and maybe you're thinking about it. And it carries over into Sunday night with this. And whether it's what you learned in a class setting or what you learned tonight or this morning, and you make choices and you determine action because what you hear, that's what the Spirit, the spirit of God does as he comes alongside us. Uh, you know, I, I, I sum up verse 19 in an adage that we might say today. Well, I've made my bed. You know where the rest of it goes, right? Now I've got to lie in it. That's a common adage that we might hear in our world today. You reap what you sow is another one. And, and this is what we see. Jeremiah paints a horrific scene with the summation there and determining the consequences from saying, God, you are inconsequential. Well, we don't ever set out of our day and say, that's what I'm going to do. Hey, I just don't want to think God matters. I, don't, I want to tell God, you are really inconsequential. You would have to be the village idiot to even think about speaking those words, let alone go out with a mindset to live out such a foolish game plan. But at the end of a day, at the end of the day, when you assess how you lived your life that day, whether it was in a hall room of a classroom, as some of you get ready to go back to school, and others in what we do in our workforce, and yet others in just what we do, period. Nobody in your right mind says, I'm going to get up today and just go rebel against God. We don't say it that way, but there's a lot of action or lack of action that we might do that causes such a ripple effect. I think Galatians 6 and 7 is still in the Bible, right? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. 
What silver man sows, he'll reap. And what, what befuddles me, and I'm not going to go into the Olympics, I, I, there's no point in even commenting about it. The sad part about it is the fact that we're acting like all of a sudden an event, and I'm with you because I'm changing my actions of what I was going to be doing the next two weeks and not doing it all. But regardless of that, shouldn't we do that with everything that offends us today? Why do we look at one thing specifically and say, well, now I'm going to, this is what happens when we become offended and we see things that bother us. But the sins still bother us. There's been a lot of sin that happens in our world that we see legislative action. It's not in France, but in the United States of America. Does it still offend us? Does it still bother us? Is there consequence in determining the fact by our very way we live, by the way we vote, by how we conduct ourselves in our Christian faith? God, you matter. I can use the big word inconsequential, but at the end of the day, God, you matter. Or God, you really don't matter in the way I'm going to live. When you say it that way, it sounds like it's a little more direct than it is. So I want to ask you a couple questions. I want to look at some things tonight. I'm going to ask you some questions with this. First of all, I want you to see how we see God. You say, that's ridiculous. You can't see God. And you know what I mean by that. It's our viewpoint. It's our viewpoint, because this is where it all starts. If, if, if we don't set out to see God in the way we live our lives, then of course you're going to determine that it's inconsequential. What's the old saying, y'all? Out of sight? Of course. So if I don't, if when I get done with a Sunday, um, I put my Bible somewhere where it's conveniently out of my view sight, I don't have to think about picking it up and reading it. It's not by the bedstand. It's not anywhere near where I might be trafficking or moving in my house. Or, you know, when I go to my uh, homepage on my, on my, where I see most of my apps right away, you know, is that where your Bible app is? Or is that kind of tucked away, maybe three screens or four screens clicks away, you know, as we scroll back? Oh, there's my Bible. Bible really doesn't matter as much as my social media feeds and every, you know. So how do we see God? Well, I want to back up to verse 6 and 7. And again, I'm, I'm going to read... From this perspective here, you can follow along in your translation there. And, and I'm going to look at some of this so you can help, help me with this, because I'm still trying to figure it all out myself. Because initially, the reaction of the prophet is, verse 6, Lord, there is no one like you. You are great, and your name is full of power. He just kind of sung about that. Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? That title belongs to you alone. Among all the wise people of the earth and all the kingdoms of the world, there is none like you. And then drop down to verse 10. Scripture records there, but the Lord is the only true God. He is the living God and the everlasting king. The whole earth trembles at his anger. That's that fear and awe. The nations cannot stand up to his wrath. Say to those who worship other gods, quote, your so-called gods who did not make the heavens and the earth, will vanish from the earth and from under the heavens. But the Lord made the earth by his power, and he preserves it by his wisdom. <laughs> there's, there's a lot in that right there. We think we're the ones that keeping this world afloat. And we need to go back to Jeremiah 10, 12. It's he that preserves it by his wisdom with his own understanding, this possessive pronoun, because he is the one who stretched out the heavens. We see the, the, the spectacular imagery of God as he's pictured there for us. Verse 13, when he speaks in the thunder, the heavens roar with rain. He causes the clouds to rise over the earth. We see the great creator. He sends the lightning with the rain and releases the wind from his storehouses. Let me just hit pause for a moment. How well do we really see? I know it's Sunday, so it's probably not the right time to ask this question. So maybe tomorrow morning or by tomorrow night, maybe it's time to get on the scale. Isn't that what we do when we're dieting or when we're conditioning, when we're trying to build up maybe some mass in some way or we're trying to see, you know, we, we, we might have squatted uh, 400 before, but now we're trying to see if we're building. So now we're squatting 450 or we're benching a certain amount and we want to measure that against what we are in two months or what I did last week and see if I'm progressing or I get on the scale and I used to weigh this. Hey, I, I lost this. I'm doing better. And, and so we, we do this. Well, we do this with God. We have to see God. 
And in a world that's so contaminated with sin, it's critical. Please, church, understand this. If we don't get a godly viewpoint to things that are going on around us, and and let me just caution you, if our viewpoint is based on what Pete says or what your teacher says, and we've got excellent people in this church, and I'd like to think I'm not leading you astray, but I'm also human too, and your teachers are as well. It's very vital that we say what thus saith the Lord says. That's why I invite you to open your Bibles, follow along. Not with our eyes, but we need to see a biblical viewpoint as we look at the world in which we live. So here's some questions to ask. I wrote down five that are based on some of the scriptures we just read. Number one, verse six, does anything or anyone really compare in my life to God? Does anything or anyone really compare? Now, on on the surface, before you do a deep kind of list here, and that may be wise, what matters most to you? is what we're saying, is God supremely at the top, and is it even a close second, or is there a wide gap? Because God is not really that important as I thought he was. I say it, but by the way, I, and you know how you can tell some of that. Look at how much, if you're, if you're a digital person, look how much you spent in your Bible app this week, if that's where you do most of your reading from, and then look at what you do with your, your stre- streaming services. You got all that screen time stuff. And see, really, you've got a way you can measure those things. Do you think about God when you get in the car? I mean, don't get me wrong, I understand. You get in a car and you may just want to decompress. But man, there's something good about putting the right stuff in you. So maybe it's that favorite preacher or, or favorite Christian artist or somebody that you can get. Does anything or anyone really compare? Well, the way we know that is by the way we do, do our time. Number two, verse seven, do we have an awe of the greatness of God? I mean, when we think about trembling out of fear and reverence and awe and respect of God, do do we really have that, or do we just talk a good game? Yeah, I'm scared to death of God, but our actions say otherwise. Um, At the risk of alienating a certain group of people in our church, I can tell you, I was scared to miss church growing up. True story. I was afraid... If my team was playing, I remember one year my team was playing in the Super Bowl. It didn't happen very often. I grew up a Dolphins fan. Dan Marino was my guy, gunslinger. I loved watching him. Forget handing the ball off, no offense running backs, just chuck it all day long. And so that Marino was a gunslinger, and I liked that. And, and, and so, but they never could win a Super Bowl. And I wasn't around in 72 when they went undefeated, so that didn't really, I was, but I was a kid, and I went and watched him. But anyway, I, I remember thinking, man, I can't. I, I better not stay home tonight. Of course, that wasn't really an option. I was just trying to play sick sometimes to stay home. And, and, and I, but I'm like, if I fake it and I miss church and my team loses, it's probably my fault. I mean, I was scared. I'm, just, I'm being real. That's the culture I was raised under, the influence my mother gave me. And, and I'm thankful for that, honestly. You say, that's just, that's just another church service, is it? <laughs> Does God really matter that much? Do we have that kind of awe of God or is it just another church service, just another thing to do? I hope tonight, I mean, Lisa and I have talked about this a lot, and we've talked about this even in our staff meetings. Is Sunday night just another thing we do? Obligatory, mind you, not really what we want to be here. I mean, we clap tonight. I'm like, hey, do y'all know it's Sunday night? We're supposed to just get through this, right? Kind of get on with our nights and we hurry and get home? No, we want to worship, right? And I love that. So anyway, number three, do we consider that devaluing God by worshiping other gods demands consequential action, verses 10 and 11. What I mean by that is, is the Bible declare God just? It's God just. So by his very nature, when we cross lines with him, now granted, we don't get what we really deserve. That's called, you know, mercy. But in essence, we know God is long-suffering, but there are consequences for sinful behavior. That's what a good parent does to correct the mistakes of a child. And God does that with us. And, and so we are, by our own actions, when we act out of bounds, we are daring God, demanding, God, I know you're not going to do this, you know? And God, by his just nature, oftentimes because of great love, to whom the Lord lo- loveth, he what? Chasteneth, or he, he, will ch- he will whip, he will punish to correct the problems. And so that's what we see in verses 10 and 11. And then fourthly, I say this in a different way. Why does the biblical account of creation matter? Intelligent design, as we call it today. 
Why does it matter so much? Did you see what verse 12 showed us? Verse 12 really barked, and I parked it in there because I think there's something to be said. But the Lord made the earth. Well, if everybody would just get this, we wouldn't waste our time in a lot of stupid stuff in science, right? Why would we want to waste such blah, blah, blah about some pieces of rock colliding or some sludge coming up out of the ground that just miraculously forms a skeletal system and a structure where it didn't have all together before and the organs change, everything. I mean, most people that have any understanding of anatomy and DNA and science know this has to be like the craziest thing. Y'all watch too much sci-fi TV or something, you know? Ray Bradbury theory. The, the, the kids don't even know what I'm talking about now when I said that. But anyway, the, you know, and, and now all of a sudden, here we are. Are you kidding me? Boy, it just seems like it'd be a lot easier to just say, you know what? The Lord made the earth by his power. Sounds good. And he preserves it by his wisdom. Not only does he create it, but he sustains it. Have you thought all these years that we've, that we've had, and you, some of you are going to give me a timeline, and you know, I get the 6,000 year, and I'm not against that. I'm, I know we're not millions. Uh, if you're on that theory, we need to have a deeper conversation. But if we have this uh, young earth, as we would call it in the science realm, uh, from a biblical perspective. If we have that, have you understood, no matter it's been 6,000 years or however many years you think it is, do you understand that all this time God has preserved what he's done? You say, well, we've had storms. I understand that. He promised that the world would never have a worldwide natural disaster again until he declared otherwise. To our history records, we never bear any of that. That's sustaining it. That's what God does. Do we, do we understand that the story of creation is everything? When you, when you take creation, and I'll just get into apologetics for a brief moment. When you take the account of biblical creation and you substitute it or you, you edit it or you delete it all together, it, it's exactly what Satan wants. Because if you take out creation, the very foundation of the living word of God becomes suspect. Because then the, God, the Bible is a lie. And everything in it must be a lie. That's why it's very important to believe and see what God says and trust him at his word. And by the way, if you'll do the real research in our world, you'll see the creation makes the most sense anyway. Even non-believing people come to grips with that. Non-believing scientists say it's much easier to believe. Several do the account of the Bible as opposed to some of the concoctions that man has come with. So yes, why does the biblical account of creation matter? It does. And in verse 13, do we see the sovereignty of God? Translation is, do you see the fact that God is totally in control? And, and all that is put there. When he speaks in the thunder, when you see him work in how he uh, waters the ground and how he sees the water cycle through. And I know science can explain it, but only God can do it in the way he does it. And it's so stinking cool. The, the clouds to rise. You, you, you understand he's showing us the water cycle here. And, and, and he's giving us a beautiful picture of how it works. And the lightning with the rain releases the wind from his storehouses in such a way. Uh, there's such a beautiful picture that said, how do we see God? That's a great thing that we need to establish our, in ourselves. And then we see also, I want to see some more scripture here. I want you to see the problem. We, we just... Gave you the great stuff, and now we got to get into the filth. I hope you got your uh, has, hazmat suit or whatever, I mean, because this is fixing to get dirty and stinky and bad, because this is where man messes up. We see God's word. We see who God is. We ask these questions, and unfortunately, man is not happy with the answers, so we, we create our own deity in ourselves. And this is what God says. Are you ready? Verse 8. He says there, I'm going to back up. I'm kind of jumping a little bit. Hang with me. People who worship idols are stupid and foolish. Can I get an amen? <laughs> are you allowed to say stupid and foolish? Apparently, yes. The Bible used the word brutish. I like the NLT because it really, nobody says you're brutish anymore. Um, I like what it says there because it's foolishness. It's folly. It is literally uh, the, 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 the mindset of, of a person that has not had their marbles. You've done the data, you've done the research, and you know there's a God, and yet you still refute to live like there is one. So we substitute. This is what we're looking at here. How we see God, number two, how we substitute God in our world. But they, it says there, this is what happens. And in verse, he says, people who are worship idols are stupid and foolish. Watch, why? The things they worship are made of wood. 
I'm all about, I've got some beautiful wood in my house. I'm nothing against the wood. I like going out in the woods. I ain't worshiping no daggum tree, though. <laughs> no offense. Why would you want to do that? Hey, it's a tree. It's nice. So I had um, environmental biology years and years and years and years ago when I was in college. And it was cool because we got to go on nature walks around campus. And we had certain trees. And that's about as close as I really got to all that stuff. And, I, and that was really cool talking about it. Of course, they had their spin on what the rings meant and how long the trees had been there. And their misguided calculations. But anyway, I thought it was cool because the word stock there is not stocks as we think of. Jeremiah knew what the stocks were, but they were made out of wood. And so that's where some of that word came from. That's what it literally means. It's crazy that the things that God produced, we can't see the God who made them, but we're too busy worshiping them themselves. Romans chapter 1 talked about the fully of that. They, they worship creation more than the creator. <laughs> it, it, it's mind-boggling. Paul struggled with that as he tried to consider it. But this is the danger that happens if we're not careful. And so we see there that, that um, verse 9, they bring beaten sheets of silver from Tarshish and gold from Uphaz, and they give these materials to skillful craftsmen who make their idols. And it's like they're playing house with these. Watch this. They make them all ornate. Then they dress these gods in royal blue and blue and purple robes. If your team has royal blue and purple, you might want to switch teams. I'm just saying. Made by expert tailors. Like, like that's going to make it better. You know, they spend umpteen more dollars because it's a brand name, I guess. I don't know. But it, 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 it's sad. And then you drop down to verse 14 and 15. Watch this. The whole human race is foolish and has no knowledge. The craftsmen are disgraced by the idols they make, for their carefully shaped works are a fraud. These idols have no breath or power. Idols are worthless. They are ridiculous lies. Notice, he doesn't put it in a, in a, in a in, in, he puts it in a, a, an image, but he says on the whole, this is all a lie. Who's the father of lies, by the way? I'm trying to remember. Is that God? Who's the father of lies? The, Satan, the devil. So hand in hand, well, we know that the devil got mad and he got kicked out of heaven because he wanted to worship and he tried to take over heaven. We know that Isaiah speaks to this. So, so this is just par with his nature. Well, I can't beat heaven. I can't beat God. So I'll try to vie for the people's worship. We know that when he confronted Jesus, y'all talked about that honey in y'all's class today. Um, over a wonderful array of donuts, mind you. We talked about the beauty of God and, and, and what we do and, 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 you know, that contest where Satan challenged uh, God through Jesus and tried to get him to basically bow down and worship him because we know that's, that's Satan's end game. He wants the, the worship. So when you're worshiping idols, understand, it's not that you're worshiping an idol that's the problem. It's you're taking your worship away from the one that deserves it, the rightful one, the only one. There is no other God but God. We know this. The Bible declares these to be worthless, and we allow ourselves to be duped. I, I understand you don't have a statue at home, nor do I, but I've got a TV. You know, some of you got gaming consoles. Some of you may have problems with your phone or other things. Or you may open your refrigerator and find some problems. Things that probably, you know, and you could just be a fitness nut and you just worship being fit so much. Uh, there was a conversation that Paul had, I think, with Timothy. Bodily exercise is good. It just doesn't give you as much as God. He said bodily exercise profits little. When you compare it to the kingdom work, yeah. I'm not against taking care of yourself. Just don't do it all day long where you forget about God and what matters around the, the priorities of life. Idols are worthless, but yet... We give them redeeming value. That's what we do. No, no, nothing has ever come to me and said, you better do this or else. Those donuts, I'm not going to tell you how many were eaten and consumed. I'm, just, I'm close enough right here. And we and God are having a conversation. I can multitask. We're talking right now as I speak. But those donuts, they, they didn't look at me and say, Pete, come on. It's been a while, buddy. You know you want to catch up, right? I don't have to do that. I know, I'm Baptist. I already got something working against me. I know how this works. But we substitute. Well, what do you mean? You know, I don't know. I'm not going to worship food. But yet, don't we sometimes? What do you mean by that? What happens when I get down in the dumps? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Where's my tub of ice cream at? I'm just going to 
And I'm just scooping up my ice cream, and I'm just going to keep on eating. Or the chip bag. God forbid we actually just pour a couple in a bag. No, 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 no. Just take the bag with me, and I'm just going to soak over my chips, right? Or whatever it is. It, it can consume us if we're not careful. When God tells us to cast our care upon him. This is what happens. You say, that seems pretty harsh. Is it? Is it? Is this not what God instructs us? And we start self-medicating in our own ways. And the next thing you know, we, we start finding ourselves in unhealthy habits. And God doesn't like that. He's trying to help us so we don't get into those cycles. I'm preaching to myself tonight. I was supposed to be preaching to you guys. Okay. We're in this together, right? Number three. I want you to see also how we suffer from sin against God. How we suffer from sin against God. Would, would you look over in verses 16 through 22 with me? I want you to see these because there's some good stuff here. 16 through 22. Watch this. But the God of Israel is no idol. He is the creator of everything that exists, including Israel. <laughs> His own special possession. He's reminding them, hey boys, you know where you come from? Hey gals, you know, where you, you know who it is? And then he reminds us, and this is very strong language, and I'm going to come back to this. The Lord of Heaven's armies is his name. He's trying to tell us, you see what I got behind me, guys? I'm packing. You better be careful. So it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous image to remind us that God is real and the power that he brings with him and military force of power and might and, and enforcement of what he's speaking. He's packing, and we better be ready. Verse 17, pack your bags and prepare to leave. The siege is about to begin. For this is what the Lord says. Suddenly I will fling out all of you who live in this land. You just like a, like a gnat or a bug. That's where we sit in God's viewpoint compared to what we think we are. And God's just like, these that are the enemies, these that denounce God. Suddenly I will fling out all of you who live in this land. I will pour great troubles upon you at the last. You will feel my anger. And then we read verse 19, my wound is severe. This is our reaction I'm struggling, I'm hurting, I'm, I'm in pain. But I love the accountability. I mean, I don't love it because I've probably spoken this in a certain way or another, maybe not as clearly as the language here. My wound is severe, my grief is great, my sickness is incurable. What a sad place. And worst of all, I must bear it. I'm reaping what I sow. But I want you to go a little bit further, and I want you to see how far this goes. And I hope I'm getting, I'm getting your attention tonight, moms and dads and grandparents. Because it's serious business, and you sitting by and saying, it's okay, it's all right, we'll just pray it all goes away, and maybe I'll get right one day. You better be careful about what you say. My home is gone. Do you see that? No one is left to help me rebuild it. My children have been taken away, and I will never see them again. Wow. Verse 22, or 21. The, the word the King James uses, pastors, I, I purposely went to a different translation because I didn't want to put myself, no, I'm just joking. The word is actually shepherds. And it represents leadership, those in leadership. And if you've been with us on Wednesday night, you know the picture of the great shepherd, the good shepherd of Psalm 23. This isn't a reference to him. This is lowercase s, the shepherds of my people. The leaders of my people have lost their senses. <laughs> they no longer seek wisdom from the Lord. Well, that's what he means. It's not that they lost their marbles. It's just they forgot God, and that's what it looks like from heaven's seat. Therefore, they fail completely. Did you see that? The outcome is because of the lifestyle. Rega disregard God, lose your mind, forget his wisdom, fail completely, and their flocks are scattered. So we see the imagery. The family, the home, what you represent, that you have guidance over and direction. Listen, verse 22, hear the terrifying roar of great armies. Here we are again, and this is figurative to Babylon in their time. As they roll down from the north, the towns of Judah will be destroyed and become a haunt for jackals. The, the King James used the word dragons. That's not the word we think of, you know. Um, this is, we talked about this a while back where wild animals come in and occupy a land because it's desolate. There's nothing left. This is the imagery. And it's very strong. I want to back up. And I want you to see the trouble they're in in verse 18. I could spend a lot of time here, but we're just going to run through this. Suddenly I'll fling out all of you who live in this land. Great trouble upon you because God is angry. You ever made your parents really mad? So, some of you kids, or even us adults, can remember a time. You know, I know I'd gotten them, but I remember certain times 
that I really went past. You crossed that line. Dustin, you're smiling way too big. I don't want to know. We'll have a talk later on, okay? There's, there's mom smiling too, so it's okay. Um, there's, there's that point where you know you really crossed the line. Maybe she's been warning you or he'd been warning you, and you done did it. And now you're going to get it. And you know you're not just like, oh, I'll just take it for the team and I'll be all right. You know it's going to hurt. It's going to be rough. You're not going to be the same after this. There's going to be severe consequences, and you thought you were going to keep getting away with it and keep getting away with it, and there's no more getting away with it. When the prophet pictures the coming wrath in the form of these armies, it's not that the Babylon was all that. God was allowing them to be all that. He'd shielded them thus far, but unfortunately for them, they continue to cross the line and cross the line and cross, oh, God's long-suffering. God's, and how many times have we crossed the line and crossed the line and said, God, you're long-suffering. You won't hurt me. You won't come after me. You need me. <laughs> Boy, do we get arrogant sometimes, don't we? Man, I, you, I, I, I have an important place in my work. I have an important place in my family. I have an important place in my church. You need me. It's funny how God can find us a quick replacement in all these things if he really wants to. But yet here we are in our minds. Matter of fact, I, I mentioned that text, my wound is severe, verse 19, my grief is great, my sickness is incurable, and I must bear it. I'm going to go to a different translation on this one, and this is actually the, the CEV. Uh, the Bible tells us there, and it actually puts it in the form of a question. The people answered, we are wounded and doomed to die. Boy, that's really tough. And then it doesn't say it in a statement, it says it in a question. Why did we say we could stand the pain? Boy, that's sobering. Why did I think I could stand the consequences for my actions is the way I'm just kind of saying it. Why did I think I'd really be able to get through this? Teacher in Bible college, I will never forget this because I've unfortunately seen this. You can determine the sin, but you cannot determine the consequences. If you don't ever remember a thing I say outside of God is good and salvation is amazing, I hope you don't lose sight of that. Because too often we play with sin and we don't realize there's fangs on the other side and that venom gets in the body quick. And it's toxic. And we know that Satan doesn't come to cuddle up with us. He's come to kill and destroy. And he's doing such a good job. And we see the peril of our homes, the danger because it's not just about us. Oh, I, I, I can bear it. But when you want to watch your kids suffer and your grandkids suffer, that's tough. That's tough. And I know I'm stepping into some territory here, and I'm just trying to preach the Word of God. And if I can shake us a little bit so we don't live in a pattern that we may be living in, then help us, Lord, please. Because as the home goes, guess what goes? The nation and in our community, now they didn't have this in the Old Testament, but let's talk real. As the home goes, guess what goes? The church. Our churches are built of, of homes and units that reinforce the, the life and, and the principles of holy God. And we say the Bible matters and God matters and worship matters and, and honoring God matters and sharing Jesus matters. And we, in, we bring in all these things that God tells us and we come together under this uh, geographic location here as Landmark Missionary Baptist Church so that we can fulfill these things. And we've got to defend ourselves through the word because we can't do it ourselves because sin is tempting and it allures and it tries to entice. And, and, and we've got to remember, I can't afford to let my kids suffer for my actions. I can't afford to let my grandkids suffer because the Bible talks about generational sin. Look it up. And I may not get me, but I, the worst thing it can do to me is not get me, but what about my kids and my grands? Will they know Jesus one day? I hope so. Why? Because of what I'm doing. Job, praying man, I don't know if my kids are living right today. I'm going to pray for him. He'd go down every day and pray for his kids. The model for the home still matters because we need God inserted fully in it. Can I, can I just circle the wagons a little bit? We don't have to worry about Paris, France if we're taking care of business as we should in our own backyard. If everybody took care of their backyard, by the way, we just had Brother Anthony Phillips here. Good idea would probably put a lot more time into praying for our missionaries in France as opposed to getting all up in arms on social media. It's not going to fix that. Nobody's going to get more spiritual because you made a statement and I made a statement and I have. I'm not apologizing for my beliefs and convictions. But what I'm saying is let's put a dent in the kingdom. Let's make it matter. How? 
do what I'm supposed to where I live. Do what I'm supposed to because I want my grandkids and my kids to live right. And we want to do this in a godly fashion. It matters. Man, I wish our families would get a hold of this. I love our generations that are coming up. We've got some great students in our church and some great kiddos. And it throws my heart to watch them come to church and watch them see what mom and dad are doing. And they're learning and they're sitting at mom and dad's feet. I used to have kids that did that. It just throws my heart to see them chasing God in spite of some of the things that they know about mom and dad. They still want to chase God. And some of the things they experience in church hurt. They still want to chase God as the home goes. And so goes the nation. And so goes our churches. You know, the sad part is we get all up in arms about we need more prayer in school. And we need more prayer. And we need more Bible reading in schools. We get all up in arms. And you know what the average home's doing? It goes to church on Sunday morning. Ain't doing a whole lot of praying. Ain't doing a whole lot of Bible reading, are we? And we'll fuss about what's going on in the schools. And we don't even do it in our homes. Joshua 24, 15, still in the Bible, y'all? Or did we get a big magic eraser? Y'all remember what that one says? Choose you this day whom you will serve. What does that mean? Idols. Who are you worshiping? Joshua says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve, we're going to worship, we're going to honor God. And that's not just on Sunday. We're going to do it all the time. They didn't have church back then. They had a mindset for God and the things of God. Verse 21, let's preach about those pastors I don't want to talk about. Because the pastors are leaders. And yes, you step into leadership, you understand there's responsibility that goes with that. You can't just do what you want and be a leader. There's consequences. Let me tell you who your leaders are, in case you don't know. Yes, first and foremost, above the, uh, above the pastor. I'm going to say this, and I don't mean it from a spiritual perspective, as God ordains offices in a church with pastors and deacons. But I believe the first line of defense for every individual that's born on planet Earth is mom and dad. And this is why families are disintegrating. This is why the divorce rate is high. This is why people can't get along. That's why we've redefined marriage and society. The devil's doing a great job, isn't he? We've forgotten to put up the fence around our own backyards, and now we've allowed society to creep in. We haven't done our job. And I'm not trying to hate on anybody that's felt this thing of divorce. Some of, I, I'm not trying to say even if you've made mistakes in the past in this. I'm just trying to say here's where we are because of the mistakes we have made. So the best line of defense for your kids and your family is not me and Brother David. And that's no disrespect to you, brother. I know you know where I'm at because we talk. The best line of defense is you, Mom and Dad. Don't just post about bringing your kids to church. Just do it. <laughs> and don't just drop them off. Sit with them, work with them, or, or, or come across the street and worship so you can get stronger, so you can do the things you're supposed to. We live in a world now where grandparents are having to step in because mom and dad aren't mom and dad anymore. It's a scary proposition. I'm really not supposed to say what I'm fixing to say. You're going to help me clean out my office tomorrow? I think it's going to get me. In. I think it's scary that we live in a world where one hour a week is all I need of Jesus. That ought to be troubling. The average church member, that's not, I know it's Sunday night, and I, I love you guys that are watching from home maybe, and that's good too, but there's something special about congregating together. COVID scared us, and we got a little bit rattled and all that. Pastors are leaders. It's who we are in our homes. It's who we are in our churches. Yes, I was a man of God. I got to own it. I understood that commitment a long time ago, and I'm not great at it. I can tell you that right now. I'm weak at times, and I need your encouragement. I desperately need your prayers. Uh, who do you think the devil's after the most in the average church? The pastors, the leaders, the deacons, the teachers. Because if we can get you to quake and you don't, you, I, I'm amazed at how little we know about the Bible anymore. Moms and dads, I've got a test if you want to give your kids. I got a test. We, we did this several years ago at a camp. And we were astonished at what we thought because kids were coming to church all the time, how little they knew about the Bible. Simple things. And we're raising people up. And one day, hopefully, these guys are going to be ready to teach classes. And, and we're, we're not deep. We got all the practicals down, but we don't have any, any serious doctrine. I love doctrine, y'all. And I'm not scared of doctrine. Biblical doctrine is what we need in our homes. It's what we need in our families. It's what we need in our churches. We always definitely what we need in our pulpits. Pastors to churches as the presidents and politicians are to countries. Can you flip back with me just to Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 8 for a moment? I want to look at this. I wanna, I'm going to look at this one here. And I want you to see this. And I'm almost done. I know we've gotten a little long. It's a long chapter and it's just so much 
meet. Poor Dusty came up to me yesterday and said, Pastor, I got a question. Dusty's like, I'm never asking Pete a question again. It's kind of like Jeremiah chapter 10 all over. Dusty, I love you, man. It's okay. You didn't do anything wrong. We just, he, he had a good question. And I said, hey, I'm going to try to dive into the Bible with you. And we did. I don't know how to answer a Bible question in usually two or three sentences. There's usually a lot of context to it because I don't want you to get my opinion if you ever ask me a Bible question. I want to give you a Bible. Thus saith the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 8. The priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew not, me not. The pastors, there's that word, also transgressed against me. Well, there's no church, so we know this is not, this is referring to the priest. And then we see the prophets prophesied by Baal. So they weren't even listening to God. They were teaching the things of Baal and walked after things that do not profit. <laughs> so what we find is there's religion, but it's not God. So therefore, it has nothing to do with Christianity. You know how many churches are meeting and there's no, there's a lot of religiosity, there's a lot of things. And this is why I'm, I'm setting the stage for something that I'm convicted about and I'm thankful for iron rubbing, iron sharpening iron. Cameron and I had a good talk and he reminded me of something I did in a series at a previous church and I'm going to do it next Sunday night and I'm going to encourage you to come back next Sunday night and I'm going to show you a 45 minute video clip. If any of you ever watched American Gospel, then you'll be familiar with it and if you haven't, you need to be here. And don't cheat and go get online and look it up so now I don't have to go to church. I think you need to do it in a corporate setting because it'll open up some good conversation. And I've got a clip I'm going to show you that backs up everything I'm saying here because of the, promise, the problems that we often have when we don't value the most important teachings. And we water them down and we then become deluded and we come up with a man's means of, of reaching heaven. That's called religion the way we do it now. And I can't get to heaven on my own. I worship God. And I try to be as spiritual, and yes, godly religion is mentioned in the Bible because it's our attempts to reach God, but not in a form of salvation. And that's what we've made it become. And the world sees people as religious because they're morally good, and it's not biblical. It's not what, the Bible says, Romans 3 and 10, there's none righteous, there's nobody good. And yet, we've redefined the Bible. And this is why we need to see what the Bible says we have Christian music now. I wouldn't call it Christian music, but I hear it on Christian radio stations tell us how good we are and how amazing we are. No, we're not. <laughs> I'm not very good. And you, you need to see yourself that way too so you can see the holiness and goodness of God. Let's talk about the goodness of God instead of how good I am and, and how I'm, I'm, I'm all right even though I'm a mess. No, you're not. That's why you need God. I know he pulls it all together. We got to be careful about this deconstruction stuff that's creeping into Christianity. It scares me how We've lost the center of where we're going in Christ. I mean, that's the very essence of what we are as Christians, is Christ. Anyway, verse 22, desolation. Behold the noise of the brute. And that's the, that's the man's foolishness. We, we, we stumble and fumble. Listen, hear the terrifying roar of great armies. As they roll down from the north, the towns of Judah will be destroyed. This is the desolation. And there's nothing to show for it in the end. So what do we need to do? And I just, I'm not going to, I'm going to read this. I'm going to give you the points and then we're going to, we're going to get ready. So Austin, if you want to come on, y'all start coming, okay? 23 through 25, ready real quick. I know, Lord, that our lives are not our own. This is Jeremiah's prayer now. Fourthly, we've got to see it how we need to submit to God. How do we fix this mess we've created? How do we get out of this pit we're in? How do we get our families back? How do we get our worship back? How do we get our hearts and lives back? How do we see revival? I know, Lord, that our lives are not our own. Quit putting it on you and center it back where it belongs. We are not able to plan our own course. So correct me, Lord, but please be gentle. We know the wrath of God. Do not correct me in anger, for I would die. He's got a holy respect for what God can do. Pour out your wrath on the nations. He said, rather channel that towards the ones that are really doing it, uh, that refuse to acknowledge you, on the peoples that do not call upon your name, for they have devoured your people Israel. They have devoured and consumed them, making them the land of desolate wilderness. Ready? Number one, verse 23, surrender to God. Three S's. We need to submit. How? Surrender to God. Number two, seek correction from God. Quit reading self-help books. There's a great book called The Bible that God has put together to correct us for all the mistakes we keep continually making as a, church, as a church, as a community, as a country, and as a world. Seek the Lord. 
we got to open our Bibles and see what God's saying. Thirdly, verse 25, strike down ungodly influences. we got to get them out of our life. This ungodliness that we continue to bring into our lives and in our circles and in our communities and our influences, get them out. Surrender them to God. Submit and, and, and put yourself in a position. That's what the word submit means, that we put ourselves in a place where God can work. Heavenly Father, you get the glory. Father, you correct us. Father, we need you tonight. Our homes are at stake. Our churches are at stake. Our eternal souls, Father, whether they're in heaven or hell, based on our decisions, even tonight, are at stake. You matter way more than what I think and I feel. And even my selfish wants and my sinful lust, you matter. The things that my nature craves, may they be surrendered to you. And may I crave and hunger and thirst only for righteousness and holiness and godliness. And my nature doesn't want that, but I have a nature within me in Christ that does. And may this be our prayer tonight that we seek revival. We can't see a holy revival for our country until we see revival tonight in our hearts and lives. So, Father, yes, help us to draw that circle around our hearts tonight and say, God, start with me, working in me. We see a need for Jeremiah 10, an Old Testament text hundreds of years ago, so desperately needed tonight. May you get the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me as we have?